Lacoste, at the top of the Pyrenees, in southwestern France. An unexpected place of remembrance and tribute. An Allied war cemetery that is one of the Commonwealth's and British Empire's smallest, highest, and most inaccessible grave sites in the world. We all seen the uh, debarkment in Normandy, but there are a lot of people that lost their life beyond that. Ces aviateurs britanniques. These British and Canadian airmen come and die here in a place they don't even know, bringing weapons to French resistance fighters that they also don't know, but who in the end are fighting the same fight as them. At 1,640 meters altitude, there is a remote piece of Second World War history. Nevertheless, this place played a crucial role in Europe's future. Here, seven young airmen of the Royal Air Force died. Their mission, enabled the liberation of southwestern France. I remember everything. I remember coming up there when we saw that indescribable scene. We were stupefied. It didn't look like anything we expected. Each of these men gave their life to help the French Résistance boot out the Nazi invader. He was over there not just fighting for the freedom of, of France or Europe, but he was fighting for the freedom of the world. Before us, many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I will say, it is to wage war by sea, land, and air, with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us. To wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. That speech of Winston Churchill is the spirit of a free world unwilling to capitulate. Millions of men enlist on the five continents to save Europe. I believe there's a basic element of English or British mentality, valid for Great Britain, but also for the nations that stem from former colonies, such as Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. This is their love of freedom. Adolf Hitler sees rising in front of him those who refuse his fate of defeat. It's not one people that stands up, but the entire British Empire and more, determined to defend democracy at any price against barbarism. And this in the face of the Third Reich's military supremacy. But the Third Reich has met more than its match. They understood the inherent danger of Hitler's Germany. There's also, I think, with regards to the Commonwealth, a loyalty of the people of the various dominions towards Great Britain. Great Britain is under attack, it is under threat. Citizens of the Commonwealth must go and help her, because most of the people of Canada, Australia and other dominions had family, cousins and friends there. If the nation is under threat, members of their families and friends are also under threat. Myriads of reasons why young Canadians joined up during the First and Second World Wars. 
the ones that have already been mentioned are the altruistic reasons, because democracy was in peril, and because where democracy is in peril in one place, it's in peril everywhere. So Canadians went to war to protect uh, Canadian values. Those are the altruistic reasons, but soldiers also went to war because they saw it as a grand adventure. The Royal Air Force and its air crews are the Allies' spearhead. Their objective, to achieve mastery of the air at all cost. And to do so, the RAF equips itself with an outstanding aircraft. A jack-of-all-trades bomber, the Halifax could undertake any kind of mission you could ask of it. The regular mission of the Halifax, of course, was bombing, strategic bombing. But early on, they realized the aircraft had many other capabilities, and depending upon the requirements of the day, the Halifax would be sent out for a variety of things. It could be sent out to drop mines in the English Channel or other water areas in the North Sea where submarines or German ships were a potential target. But it could also be used to, in a number of other varieties of areas called special duty. These special operations to free occupied Europe take off from Blida, south of Algiers. In early September 1943, a special RAF unit has stood up. It's the elite of the Commonwealth. RAF 624SD squadron flies men, weapons, and materiel over to the continent by day or night. Its aim, help fan the flames of insurrection in France to the south along the Mediterranean coast. On this old French Air Force base, more than a thousand men are mobilized. These volunteer pilots come from all over the world in the British Empire. Among the air crews, that of Leslie Arthur Pierce, a Canadian pilot officer. The other six are British. Here they are standing proudly in front of their aircraft. There's Charles Goebel, the flying officer bombardier. Albert John Bythorpe, flying officer navigator. Leslie Arthur Pierce. Harry Clark and Jack Brooke, sergeant machine gunners. James Edward Walsh, the flight mechanic and William Warmby, sergeant, radio operator. Leslie Arthur Pierce is a Canadian from Chatham, Ontario. He will never see his family grow up because he spent months far from home before ultimately sacrificing his life. What my mother used to do was take hundreds of pictures of me to show him when he came home to show what, what he missed of me, which is why there's so many pictures around the house of me as a baby. Back then, of course, I didn't understand what was going on. I was too young to know that I didn't have a father. But then I missed him, of course, yes, not having a father. Everybody else had a father. Why couldn't I have one? But... during the war that at one point in time he was involved in a plane crash and he sustained some pretty serious burns, but that didn't stop him. As soon as he was capable again of getting back into the cockpit and, and resuming his, uh, his duties, he believed in what he was doing, like a lot of people I think did at that point in time. I mean, in, in that point in the history of the world, a lot of people understood that this was pivotal, this was important, and it was a huge sacrifice for so many people to be involved in, but they knew they had to be part of it. And that was something we really discovered at one point in time when we saw some of his old flight logs. And he wrote about how important he felt it was to be part of the missions that he was involved in. And you could see that this was a man that felt a great deal of remorse for the fact that what he was doing was causing people to lose their lives. Probably was something that, that instilled a great sense of pride in them. And it certainly is something that we can look on and say, that was, you know, that was, you know, for my dad, he can say that was his father. I can say that was my grandfather. That's pretty special. July 13th, 1944. 
The crew of Leslie Pierce gets ready to fly once again to France. Their night mission is to parachute materiel to a resistance unit in the Pyrenees. Fully cognizant of the danger, none of the seven airmen of the Halifax will back down. Go back to when you were 20, 21, 22. Invincible, nothing can hurt me. Nothing will get in my way. I will be successful. They're not gonna get me, I'm coming home. The job they had to do was very, very precise, was very, very risky, but it required skill. You'd want people who had flown the aircraft for a period of time, who felt comfortable in the aircraft, who could then take on that challenge of meeting those target requirements through all of that adversity, through all of the bad weather, through everyone shooting at you. They would select the men who were good at flying at night and low level. So basically, the Brits really had the selection of these men to a T. They would have the best crews for this particular kind of mission. They were the, the creme de la creme, but with the kind of missions that they were doing, they knew they may not come back. Behind enemy lines, there is urgency. The Allies have landed in Normandy. The south of France is still occupied. To disrupt the German army's rear areas, you have to help the French resistance. The parachute resupply missions of RAF 624 Solo Delta Squadron have become essential. The mission of 624 Squadron was to instill insecurity to the German occupying not only France, but Italy, all the occupied countries. But the idea when a German would walk around, he didn't know if somebody would shoot him in the back. In southwestern France, since the invasion of the Free French Zone in November 1942, the border with Spain is under German control. With the Normandy landings, Hitler has ordered part of his troops to come up north. Nevertheless, the Wehrmacht still has a presence in this area. I think German presence was the worst. The fact that at times they were not always there and that she lived in fear at the thoughts of them coming back. In the mountains between Biarritz and Perpignan, you need to know that there were only roughly a thousand men. That is, a thousand soldiers of the Wehrmacht, basically divided between the military border guards, the Grenzschutz, and the mountain troops. So a thousand in all is very little. These small detachments were very mobile and were all people from the mountains. At the bottom of the valley, there's no commandanture or base. In fact, the Germans come episodically. This added to the feeling of insecurity for the resistance fighters like my grandfather. 1944, Nistos, Haute Pyrenees. Janine is 20. Her father is the primary school teacher of the village and a member of the local French resistance. She lives by his side and they both feel the repression of a desperate Nazi army. Sometime later, the Germans for the first time came up to Nistos. They wanted to know where the Maquis was. They spread out in the Nistos Valley with one soldier per house. They emptied all the armoires. They ransacked everything in all the homes, searching every nook and cranny. One German comes up to the school. When you come into the school, the class is on the left. And three meters in front, there's the junk closet, where we'd hidden the weapons destined for the Maquis. My mother leaves the door open and says to the soldier, Sir, this is a school. The kids are working. The German could see them. Nobody comes in here. And she pushes him aside. He gets out and he leaves. The Maquis of Nistos, after four years of occupation, these men and women are ready to rise up against the enemy. 
It's a communist Mackey here, where some militants come from Paris because their cell was destroyed. There is even a Russian immigrant among them. They were poorly armed. Some say that they only had two grenades each. They had some carbines. The guerrilleros had sticks of dynamite that they would light up with a cigarette, somewhat like you see at the movies. The Résistance fighters increased the number of ambushes. During the summer of 44, they harassed the enemy. Nazi concerns, though, don't stop its barbarism and brutality. If you were arrested by the French police, it wasn't too bad. You were put on trial, you could be fined, and also get 15 or so days of prison at the Noé camp. But from November 11, 1942 onwards, when the Germans arrested you, you were almost always deported. A German caught one. His name was Muzi, I think. They tortured him very badly and questioned him on the whereabouts of the Maquis. He didn't talk, and they killed him. There's a memorial on the Cap Vern ramp honoring him. From June 6, 44, the resistance comes out in the open and lays ambushes and even an armed offensive operation. At the Allied HQ in London, plans have been set. For southwestern France, there will be no invasion. The Résistance must liberate the area on its own with the help of British special forces and their aircraft. This was a combined operation between the resistance forces and, of course, the Allied forces in England, who coordinated these efforts. You know, they would send a, uh, an agent. They would drop an agent behind enemy lines with a parachute. The agent would have a specific requirement to do on the ground, provide to gather information or to maintain his location in Norway, France, so that he could coordinate the requirements. He would listen to the radio, understand the location of these special duty requirements, and then form his resistance forces, gather them up so that they were prepared for the aircraft when it came across, so that as soon as it went across and they dropped whatever it was they were dropping, they would be able to take it and hide it. The man that will help this happen is parachuted in during the night of June 28, 29, 1944. His name is Colonel Horace W. Fuller, an American U.S. Marine. He belongs to the OSS, the ancestor of the CIA. His actions are written down in this detailed report from the CIA. Seriously wounded at Guadalcanal in the Pacific, Colonel Fuller speaks French, thanks to a few months spent in France. He's here to evaluate the needs of the Résistance in the Pyrenees and to choose the group who will take delivery of the airdrop weapons. Hi, Colonel. Pleased to meet you guys. The French were very happy to see Colonel Fuller because this was really significant. We couldn't reject the great North American ally, could we? After all, the US was the arsenal of democracy at that time. These weapons, materiel, money and documents were requested months ago to start off the liberation offensive. Vous avez de quoi bouffer, de quoi boire. July 13, 1944, in Blida, Algiers, at dusk, Piers is surrounded by his crew. They are 20 to 23 years of age. It's time for the last flight checks. The materiel is loaded. Tonight, they are off for their 29th mission over Europe. They replaced an Australian crew that is not available. The last few weeks have been quite tense. You couldn't ask for time off. 
for a long period of time until you got 30 missions. 33 mission average was the time when you were allowed now to go home for a while. You could volunteer to come back if you wished, but 33 missions was required before you were considered complete. 33 missions without any leave time. Off to Nistos and its maquis. It's suicide. The price will be a costly one. In four years of conflict, 42,000 RAF airmen have died in combat. Early on in the war, three, four missions was considered a good number. If you could get to four missions without being killed, you were probably normal. If you were to get beyond four missions, six, eight, 10, you were doing better than most. So how does this affect your mind when you're flying the airplane? You're on your third mission. 50% of the people that are on their third mission don't come back. Your mind is always thinking, is it going to be me? Am I next? Colonel Fuller in the Pyrenees sounded the alarm for the uprising. The Maquis urgently needs six tons of materiel. In July 1944, these pilots with their long-range Halifax in Blida are the only ones able to answer the call for help. Because of the SOE, or the Special Ops Executive people working behind the enemy lines, to supply them, to provide them maps, to provide them information, radios, food, whatever it took to make these people happy, the Halifax was the aircraft that could do the job the best. In some respects, we might describe the Halifax as a truck. It's used as a transport aircraft, both for airborne forces and for the Special Operations Executive. Um, however, it's not the only aircraft being used in the transport role by the RAF. Other converted bombers, such as the Albemarle and the Sterling, are also used in this role, and the RAF has dedicated transport aircraft, such as the Douglas Dakota. But in terms of supporting the Special Operations Executive, it is the key large transport aircraft used for that purpose. The Halifax is a robust hybrid 22 meters in length. With a height of 7 meters and a wingspan of 30 meters. With its 8,000 liters of fuel, it has a combat range of more than 3,000 kilometers. This 24-ton aircraft flies in all weather conditions and over any terrain. Aircraft JN-888, codenamed Sea Charlie. The mission starts 2,000 kilometers from the Pyrenees and flies above the Mediterranean at wave top height so as to be invisible to Nazi radar. Five tenths hours, 400 kilometers per hour and under radio silence. No modern equipment on board. Today's world, you have radar to see where you're going. You have GPS that tells you exactly where you are. 75 years ago, they didn't have any of that. So the challenge is always, how close am I to where I'm supposed to be? Weather was always a problem because the crews needed to have a reference to fly. A horizon, perhaps the moon and the stars, but at night when you're flying, especially over water, it's all black. So a big challenge for the crew when you're flying in an aircraft such as the Halifax at night at low level. But then you bring in mountains. Talk to anyone who flies in the mountains. The first thing you concern yourself about is updrafts, downdrafts, uh, the, which the winds cause. You put all of those factors together and you probably multiply the challenge by four times just to get through there to the area you want to drop on. Usually RAF units flew 10,000 meters above mountaintops. This unit flew 7,000 meters below the mountains, and they were flying nape of the earth. In other words, uh, when they would come back from missions, they would have pieces of trees, branches. In other words, they were flying a big bomber like you would fly a fighter. It's not surprising, given all of those challenges, that a number of aircraft didn't come home, especially flying in mountainous areas such as the Pyrenees. The mountain is treacherous, and on this July 13th, 1944, you can't imagine that it's summer in the Pyrenees. It's a fog-filled, moonless and starless night. Visibility is almost nil.
place yourself in the aircraft at night, 250 knots, 500 feet above the ground, entering a mountainous area that you can't see. That sends chills up my spine just thinking about it as a pilot. The Resistos fighters of Nistos arrive on the spot. In the sky, they can barely hear the aircraft searching for the DZ. The interesting thing about the drop zones where all of the communications between the crew and the resistance forces, this was all communicated well prior to the day that they flew the mission. It was communicated through codes. They would listen to the BBC all day, all night. But at specific times during the BBC broadcasts, the announcer on the BBC would provide a code name that they were waiting for. And that code name depicted the run-in track, the direction of the run-in for the drop, the drop zone name, and the letter that they would produce on the drop zone so when the crews arrived over the drop zone, they would identify it as the correct location. And this was traditionally done at night. So the letter that was coded was made up on the ground with lighting sources, candles, lanterns, whatever. You would see a lit, let's say an A. So the people on the ground and the crew, everything was coordinated to know exactly when and where the aircraft was coming from, the target on the ground to drop on, and that made it all work. In the sky, the sounds of the props has faded. Because of the fog, the aircraft hasn't seen the signal. For the Resistance, it's a missed rendezvous. In fact, having flown twice over the area, the Halifax is just slightly off course. Appears the pilot wants to try a third time. Visibility is still bad, barely 100 meters, and still no reference points. Of the seven airmen in the aircraft, only the navigator, Albert John Bythorpe, age 20, survives the collision with the mountain. He was in the glass cupola at the front of the Halifax with the job of checking the heading and was ejected from the aircraft when it hit the mountain with its underbelly. He knows he's in enemy territory and doesn't want to be taken alive but he's seriously wounded. And during the night, the British navigation officer dies near his comrades. You live together, you, you eat together, and, and unfortunately, um, you know that there's a risk that you're going to die together. And uh, I mean, that's, that's a bond that, I, I mean, I can't even begin to understand that I've never had to worry about experiencing something like that. That must make for, an incredibly close connection between the men that were on that plane. He was 27 when he died, and but he was the oldest one on the crew, so. But when you realize only 27, that's, that's like a child today.
All the equipment was to be dropped at the Estiver Pass, which is a wide pass with a large grazing area. It was ideal. Only there was fog, and it was very overcast. Maybe it was a navigational error, who knows? Maybe they misjudged their altitude. He did three passes, coming lower each time. And on the third pass, his wing clipped one of the trees and he crashed. It's the aircraft the Résistance was waiting for at the Estiver Pass. But the crash took place at the Pic du Douli, three kilometers from there. A head-on impact right in the mountain's basin. In the valley, it's impossible to hear the crash. On July 18, 1944, three days after the crash, three shepherds lead their flock of sheep to pasture at the Pic du Douli. Fifteen-year-old René Rumeau is with his uncle, Francois. They will discover the macabre scene. The young Rumeau runs down towards the bottom of the valley. He knows every hole, each rock, and each tree stump hidden by leaves on this hill. In less than three hours, he will run 10 kilometers to the village of Nistos. He knows that at the school, he'll be able to warn the teacher and also the leader of the local resistance. In the middle of the afternoon, he ran down to warn my father that a plane had crashed. My father then left immediately, accompanied by René. My father saw what had to be done, and he decided to come back the next day. The leaders of the resistance that linked up with us lived in Tarbes. They're the ones that extricated and identified the bodies. Big beech trees had been broken and they'd crushed the aircraft. So much so that it didn't look like an aircraft. The bodies of the airmen were in fetal position and they were burned up, except for one who was much less burned because he'd been thrown out of the plane. They were totally burned. We had trouble discerning them and pulling them out. They buried all the crew on the site and he, they looked after them. They looked after them for the, the rest of the time. The weapons and the money are now much less important. For the resistance fighters, the first priority is a proper burial for those seven airmen who came from distant lands and died trying to come to their aid. These men who are burying the crew don't know it yet, but by digging these graves, they are building a symbol. I greatly admire these young airmen who came to die here because they had decided to help us. Found the plane, got the rest of the villagers up there, and they took all the stuff, the ammunition, and the boxes that they were supposed to drop out of the plane that were still good. He was indeed very much a hero. All the people of Nistos told me that he was much a hero. He saved their lives when he 
they unfortunately had to crash to do it. But they still were able to get all the ammunition and a lot of the arms out of the airplane after it crashed. They were able to recuperate a few weapons, even if a lot had been destroyed. Then they formed up what's known as the 3,201st Company. They were grouped into a quote-unquote military unit of roughly 175 men. One could say that these civilians became the 1st Battalion of the Régiment de Bigorre. They headed for the Charente, where the city of Royan capitulated in April 45, and then went on to Germany. So, they participated in all the battles of the liberation of France. May 8, it marks the end of the Second World War. A relief for the entire world. The end result of these six years of war, 60 million dead. It is the deadliest conflict in history. More than half of the victims were civilians. It's a victory for France and a victory over tyranny. Arras Cemetery in northern France. It's one of the Commonwealth's biggest cemeteries. Often by itself, it symbolizes all the destruction from the First and Second World Wars. Almost 3,000 headstones for these young volunteers who came from all over the world. They paid the ultimate price for their love of freedom. The uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission, which was established in 1917, has two main purposes. Firstly, to look after and care for the graves and the memorials of all those who died for the Commonwealth in the two world wars. Secondly, to ensure that their memory uh, is kept in perpetuity. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission cares for 1.7 million casualties at rest at 23,000 locations across 153 countries throughout the world. We're present on every continent except Antarctica. Such was the scale uh, of the two world wars and the involvement of the Commonwealth uh, in those uh, events. In all these cemeteries, there is no discrimination. All are equal in the face of adversity, be they Muslims, Christians, or Jews. All are united within the Commonwealth. The largest is here in France, Tietval, which commemorates over 73,000 casualties who have no known grave. Le Menin Gate in Ypres in Belgium, 55,000 casualties, again, who have no known grave. We must never forget the sacrifice that they gave, so many at such a young age. If you look at these headstones, just look at the ages. Children, we would say today, many of them. Uh, and we must never forget what they gave um, for us. At 1,640 meters altitude, the Pic du Douli. On some summer days, the fog is the same as it was on July 13th, 1944. For more than 50 years, the burial ground of our airmen remained a mound of earth. Thanks to Jean Borde, a former resistance fighter, and with the help of 40 or so local friends, they dug these graves in this clearing. These resting places have now become a cemetery. The seven of Flight C. Charlie are its only occupants. All these years, they have been faithfully honored by those that they came to help, and today by their descendants. As of this day in the world, this is one of the smallest, highest, and most inaccessible cemeteries of the Commonwealth. Indeed, I'm always very deeply moved, because truly for my grandfather, it was a place that he wished existed. 
he built it in part, and I think it was truly and almost his testament. He didn't keep things, he didn't leave much from his past. He would often make a bonfire of these and burn them. I believe that with this he wanted to leave a testament behind. And it's true that to see that his testament is still honoured is something that's very strong. I discovered the cemetery in 1998. I saw it was full of crosses, but we used to put up plaques. When I saw the crosses, I said to myself, this cemetery is not as per regulation. That's when I moved fast. I wrote to the embassy, to Canadian authorities, I asked questions. I asked them, you know, what's all this? Then I got into contact with old resistance fighters of the area and started to understand that this cemetery had been built by them in the French way. And for me, what they had built is a jewel. I searched and found the Pierce family, and I found out the story of his father who died while working for the SCE. He thought he had died in the Alps. Leslie Pierce burst into tears when he got here. This for him was an entire chapter of his life that all of a sudden opened up. And when we went to see that, that was probably the most emotional time in my life was when I walked up to the site and looked in there and, and met the people that actually took the, the people, the bodies out of the plane and people I had I had people coming up crying to me because they, especially the one who was supposed to light the flare. Well, the idea was it was supposed to be one pass, and if you don't see a flare, go home. It was uh, finishing off. I, I could uh, accept the fact that he was gone then. It is 6,600 kilometers between the cemetery of Nistos and Chatham, Ontario, in Canada where the family of pilot officer Piers lives. For them, to know that a grave is honored there gives even more meaning to the sacrifice of their father. In Canada, we've been lucky in so many respects because, yes, a lot of people went over to fight in the wars, and, and today they, that still goes on. France, Canada, we're still sending soldiers overseas We've always been fortunate in Canada that, that those wars weren't actually fought on our land. Our lives, our way of life wasn't in the same degree of danger. I think it's important for him to, my kids to go over, see the gravesite where their great grandfather is buried so that they could really see that history has a face. It's not just what we read in a textbook. It, it has a face. I mean, historical events are really nothing more than, than just what people do. I'm very proud of anybody who, who died over, over there. The, all the, uh, it's not just him. I mean, I cer certainly am proud of, proud of him, as he's my father, but he wasn't alone in dying over there. There was people dying all over, and, and they're all heroes to me. Even those who, who didn't die or over fighting, everybody is a hero, and I guess we're not going to eliminate war, so everybody is going to continue being heroes to try to fight for freedom, and, and, and we have to have it. Without the people of the village, the Canadians and the British who got involved, it could very well be that we wouldn't be here today. You just can't forget that important event. If we're alive and breathing these days, it's thanks to people like that. Therefore, it's impossible to forget these pages of history. These are our boys. The mountain folk adopted them as their very own sons. For the people here, it's not only their history. It's about their children. The boys here are their sons. It's when one reads the guest book that's in the shepherd's shelter beside the cemetery that we see the signatures of people from South Africa, Australia, from Great Britain and Canada that we then grasp the international importance of this little piece of mountain real estate. And it's true that we are proud to belong and have the name of somebody that made this small mountainous area an international memorial. Harry Clark! 
Sergeant Machine Gunner, RAF, died for freedom. Mort pour la liberté. Every July 13th, Edward Walsh, tribute is given. From generation RAF, to generation, their memory is freedom. not forgotten. Mort pour la liberté. William Ronald Wombey, Sergeant Radio Operator, RAF, died for freedom. What's, what's really impressive is the breadth of the affection here from young children of six, seven years old who understand what this means to a lady of 83 years old who's walked all the way up here to come here to pay her personal homage uh, of these, uh, to these seven young men. Leslie Arthur Pierce, pilot officer, RCAF, Died for freedom. They're the symbols of the battle against fascism, the symbol of the fight for freedom. And I believe that their memory was very much felt by all this morning. It was present in the silence and very much present in this gathering of the people of the valley. I think I'm very fortunate to be in France today and, and get to explore uh, those little stories like the Pic de Dooley which are amazing. To me, it's a new dimension to those conflicts because it's behind those small stories that the reality really stands. It gets bigger and bigger every year. More and more people come up here. People come a long way to pay tribute. And they come to see what happened here and the site where these folks fought and died to free our nation and the village. All of this is, it's unforgettable.